So in the last period, we looked at what the reformers did. We talked about the apostasy in the church. And today we're picking up from the time when Luther was nailing the 95 Theses against indulgences at the church at Wittenberg. And that was the day of All Saints. Is that right? Is that what we read on the Frederick's dream? It was the day of All Saints. It was a feast of the Roman Church. And the day was October 31st, 1517. Now, what happens in October 31st in our times? It's the Halloween, right? So people celebrate the Halloween in the day they should be celebrating the Reformation. Now, we are in 2017. We are just about 500 years from the Reformation. And there is a plan to announce the end of the Reformation on October 31st. At least that's what I heard. And it really worried me. Not in the sense that God can't do anything about it. Of course He can. But it worries me that Protestants are so blind that they don't even know what the protest, protest is all about. So we must look into it and try to grasp what, the, what Protestantism is about. And I would like to recommend to you a resource for studying and learning more about this. There's a website, ellenwhiteaudio.org. You can download audiobooks and ebooks, both of Ellen White and the other Adventist pioneers. On that site, you have the book, The Great Controversy. Please make use of it. If you don't want to read it, just listen through it. It's in audio. And you will be greatly blessed. But let me recommend another portion of that site. When you go to lmiaudio.org slash ebooks of the pioneers, you will be able to access the PDFs and um, EPUBs, Mobi versions of the ebooks of the pioneers, of many of them. And there are several books we're quoting from in the lectures. And one of them is called Ecclesiastical Empire. This is by A.T. Jones. It's an amazing book. You should check it out. If you can, please check it out. It will be a tremendous uh, explanation of history. Another one, History of the Sabbath, we're also quoting from uh, Jane Andrews. It's an amazing book on the Sabbath, and it talks about the Protestant Reformation. It shows that there were people there keeping the Sabbath during the Reformation. And the question that really turned um, or broke the, the argument that the Reformers were making for the Bible and the Bible only was when the Roman Church said, but why do you keep Sunday if you say you keep the Sabbath, or if you say you, you obey just the Bible? The Bible says to keep Sabbath. And the Reformers didn't know what to answer at that point. And then the other book that is very, very important is Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. This book also is a tremendous asset, a tremendous blessing. And you can benefit from it if you, if you study it. Okay, let's continue here. So why the Reformation was needed? There were some points that were happening there that made it necessary. There were some things, some events, right? So first of all, the Waldenses, who were they? Did we talk about them? Yeah. You remember? So they had been there for about a thousand years before the Reformation defending the truth, spreading the truth. And, but the, now the Waldenses had begun to compromise. What is to compromise? It's to let go of something that you shouldn't, right? It's to accept some conditions, whereas you shouldn't be doing that if it's principle, right? So they have begun to compromise principle. We'll see now an interview um, that they had with Ecolampadius. When the Reformation was very active, the Waldenses sent some people to be like ambassadors to the Reformers. 
and to know what the Reformation was all about. For a thousand years, they had been almost alone. And now they were thinking, there is another group now that is defending the truth. Let's talk to them and let's unite with them, right? So they sent a couple of people to, to, inter, to talk to the reformers. So Daubigny describes an interview between Echolampadius and two Waldensian pastors who had been sent by their brethren from the borders of France and Piedmont to open communication with the reformers. It was at Basel. Is that how you say it? Basel? Basel, right? In 1530. Many things which they said pleased Echolampadius, but some things he disapproved. Dabien makes this statement. The barbs, the Waldensian pastors, were at first a little confused at seeing that the elders had to learn from their juniors. However, they were humble and sincere men. And the Basel doctor, having questioned them on the sacraments, they confessed that through weakness and fear, they had their children baptized by Roman priests, and that they even communicated with them and sometimes attended Mass. This unexpected avowal startled, startled the meek Ecolampadius. So can you believe that? The Waldenses, which had been kept, keeping the truth for centuries, now started compromising. And it was just about when they were coming down from the platform of truth, from being the defenders of truth, that God raised the Reformation because it was the right time. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that they were doing this? And it was through fear. And they actually went back and talked about what the reformers said and tried to do uh, reform amongst themselves. Right? There were some other reasons for the Reformation. Liberty of conscience was attacked by the papacy. It was basically inexistent, right? Something that is one of the greatest privileges we have. Liberty of conscience for you to decide based on your own conscience whether it's, something is right or wrong. That was taken out by the papacy. The minds of people were forced by the prelates, you know, and if they wouldn't yield, the prelates would then declare those people that were following their conscience heretics. And they would use the arm of the state to force people to do things that went against their conscience. Persecution was relentless. The light was almost gone out. The way was needed to be prepared for the three angels' messages. So why the Reformation was needed? Because of this. There were several things, and there are more items too. But let's look at um, what Jane Andrews said about the, the, this interview, and actually what the Reformers and the Waldenses were doing. Okay? Jane Andrews says, The light of many of these ancient witnesses was almost ready to go out in darkness when God raised up the Reformers. They had suffered that woman Jezebel to teach among them and to seduce the servants of God. They had even come to practice infant baptism. And the priests of Rome administered the rite. And in addition to all this, they sometimes joined with them in the service of the Mass. If a portion of the Waldenses in southern Europe at the time of the Reformation had exchanged believers' baptism for the baptism of children by Romish priest, priests, it is not difficult to see how they could also accept the Sunday Lord, uh, Lord's Day from the same source in place of the hallowed rest day of the Lord, the true Sabbath, Saturday, right? the seventh day Sabbath. All had not done this, but some certainly had. So there were some Waldenses that kept the Sabbath and some kept Sunday at that point. Right? So what happened during this period of papal supremacy? An estimated number of 60 million people were killed by the Church of Rome during her supremacy. Now, we hear of 
you know, Hitler uh, killing, uh, you know, how many million Jews? Six million Jews? And we think that that's an absurd, and it is. But compare that to ten times more people killed by the Roman church. And who is calling that into account? Who's calling that? The Protestants are asleep. They forgot. Liberty, liberty of conscience was not tolerated by her during her supremacy. And she only tolerates now because she is powerless. Because as soon as she gets the power again, liberty, liberty of conscience will be gone. Heretics were forced to recant or else, right? If they don't, they die. And they die horrible deaths. You can visit the, the places where people were killed. It's just shocking. There were con countries even in South America that had the Inquisition going on. Peru, and there was another country. I forgot which one it was. The worship of God was replaced by the worship of images and of Mary. She was declared the mother of God the first council of Ephesus, and is now designated as co-redemptrix and mediatrix. Can you believe that? The Bible says that there is one mediator between, between God and man, Jesus Christ, the man, right? And they call Mary mediatrix. So the Reformation asserted the liberty of conscience. It put the Bible above tradition. That's why they said the Bible and the Bible only. Now, people that don't understand history, take that statement, the Bible and the Bible only, to say, oh, we cannot accept the spirit of prophecy. Because we are reformers. We are Protestants. But they forget that the point was not that God could never send again another prophet. The point the reformers were making was that the Bible and the Bible only is our base, not tradition. Not the hearsays of prelates and priests and popes and pontiffs. They were comparing the Bible to the man-made rules and decrees and saying, we don't accept both as the Roman church does. The Roman church accepts tradition and she puts it above the Bible. So the Protestants were saying, the Bible is the only source, not tradition, not what these people are saying. And then some uninformed people today take the spirit of prophecy and say, Oh, we don't need that because we are Protestants. We believe in the Bible and the Bible only. But the Reformers didn't do that. If God sent a prophet, a true prophet, and they knew it was a true prophet, they would accept it just as soon as they accepted the Bible. Right? So, there's so much confusion today. The Reformation broke the persecuting power of Rome in a great degree. It didn't finish it, but it was broken. It allowed for the light of truth to illuminate the world. It prepared the way for the Advent message. So, Luther, when the Swabian peasants revolted in 1524, he sent them a message. And he said, The Pope and the Emperor have united against me, but the more the Pope and the Emperor have stormed, the greater the progress which the gospel has made. Why so? Because I have never drawn the sword. That means he was not appealing to the state to do things, although he could. Remember Frederick of Saxony? He was the elector of Saxony. He, could, he had all the power needed to do anything there. He was only under the emperor, right? So the electors were the ones that actually elected the emperor. So, Luther continues saying, It is neither with the sword nor, uh, nor the musket that Christians fight, but with suffering and the cross. Christ their captain did not handle the sword. He hung upon the tree. Why did the pro 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 protest happen? Why did the protest happen? In 1526, the Diet of Spires had decreed that the princes and the people of Germany should not be interfered with in their worship after the Protestant order in, their freedom, in the freedom of their own consciences until a general council should meet to consider the whole question. 
And that was in 1526, right? Three years later, in 1529, at the second Diet of Spires, an attempt was made to reverse this decision. What was the first decision? Respect freedom of conscience, liberty of conscience, until a general council meets to treat on this question. So the, the Protestants were already beginning, the, the Reformation was already happening, and the Diet of Spires of 1526 said, respect freedom of conscience until we, we consider the whole question of the Reformation. Three years later, there was a, a, an attempt to reverse that decision and to actually stop the Reformation. But the princes favored, uh, who favored the Reformation said, let us reject this decree, and they're talking about the one in 1529. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. So, when the majority was in favor of the papacy, the evangelical princes determined to appeal from the report of the, of the Diet to the Word of God, and from the Emperor Charles to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They drew up a protest, and here is the beginning of the, the protest. They say, Dear lords, cousins, uncles, and friends, having repaired to this diet at the summons of His Majesty and for the common good of the Empire and of Christendom, we have heard and learned that the decisions of the last diet concerning our holy Christian faith are to be repealed and that it is proposed to substitute for them certain restrictive and onerous resolutions. We cannot, therefore, consent to its repeal. And they will go on. You can, you can read if you want uh, this. You can pause the video. Uh, they say they say that in what concerns ourselves, adhesion, adhesion to your resolution and let every honest man be judge would be acting against our conscience. So they knew what conscience was. And they knew what the Roman church was trying to do. This is amazing for me. This is amazing because Bishop Tony Palmer, you've heard of him a few years ago. He died a few years ago. But he was trying to say that the Reformation was basically just saying, oh, we are saved by grace. And that some people there in the Roman church were saying, we are saved by works. So now everybody agrees that we're saved by grace and the Reformation is over. He seems to be either willingly ignorant or really unwillingly, but he seems to be completely ignorant of what the Reformation was all about. It was about freedom of conscience and of religion, right? This is the protest. The protest characterized the word Protestant, right? So they said that if they accepted the resolution, it would be acting against our conscience, condemning a doctrine that we maintain to be Christian and pronouncing that it ought to be abolished in our states if we could do so without trouble. This would be to deny our Lord Jesus Christ, to reject His holy word and thus give Him just reason to deny us in turn before His Father as He threatened. So, they will go on and here's the amazing part that gives the, the basis for the word Protestant. They say, For these reasons, most dear lords, uncles, cousins, and friends, we earnestly entreat you to weigh carefully our grievances and our motives. If you do not yield to our request, we protest by these presents before God, our only Creator, Preserver, Redeemer, and Savior, and who will one day be our judge, as well as before all men and all creatures, that we, for us and for our people, neither consent nor adhere in any matter, was, in any manner whatsoever to the proposed decree in anything that is contrary to God, to His holy word, to our right conscience, and to the salvation of, soul, of our souls, and to the last decree of spires. Have you ever seen this before? That was the protest. 
That's why they were called Protestants. Do you see now the reason for the protest? And do you see now that when the Lutherans and the Catholics got together and said, oh, we now believe in salvation by grace, it didn't make a single difference for the protest. Because the Roman Church still rejects freedom of conscience. I read last week, there was an article showing that the Pope actually was speaking against liberty of conscience. This Pope, Francis, speaking against liberty of conscience. Have you seen that article? No. I can, I'll put the, the link on the video here. So, the Roman Church does not believe on freedom of conscience. At least not for all individuals. They believe in their freedom of conscience. And that their freedom of co conscience overrules anybody else's freedom of conscience. Right? That's the kind of freedom they believe. At least the papacy. I'm not talking about Roman Catholics. There are many Roman Catholics that are very faithful, very um, very much Christians. Very Christians. They're true Christians. And they don't agree with that idea either of trampling upon freedom of conscience. But the papacy does. And it has proven that throughout the ages. You just read that book, Ecclesiastical Empire, or another one, History of the Popes. You will see what they believe about freedom of conscience. Okay, the protest happened in April 19th, 1529. It defended liberty of conscience as above any temporal power. It put the word of God above the decrees of worldly rulers. So, in great controversy, Elamite says, one of the noblest testimonies ever uttered for the Reformation was the protest offered by the Christian princes of Germany at the Diet of Spires in 1529. The courage, faith, and firmness of those men of God gained for succeeding ages liberty of thought and of conscience. Their protest gave to the Reformed Church the name of Protestant. Its principles are the very essence of Protestantism. Great Controversy, page 197. Okay, the next year, 1530, in June 25, there was the Augsburg Confession. How many have heard of that? It's one of the grandest documents in the world, the Augsburg Confession. Okay? That sort of thing, that sort of thinking is similar to the, the thinking of the Declaration of Independence. And I, I invite you to study this confession. Okay? It clearly stated that the ecclesiastical and civil powers are separate. It rejected civil power on the part of the bishops. And it basically defended liberty. Liberty of conscience and of religion. Okay? The Declaration of Independence uh, restricts the power of kings, right? It basically says that all true government emanates from the people themselves. So, republican government is the way to go. It's the only way to go now. Any form of kingship except that of Christ, and he said that his kingdom is not of this world, is out of place, right? So, the Article 28 of that Confession of Augsburg says, of ecclesiastical power. There have been great controversies touching the power of the bishops, in which some have in an unseemly manner mingled together the ecclesiastical power and the power of the sword. Do you understand that? Ecclesiastical power is church power, right? Mm -hmm. The power of the sword is the temporal power or civil power. So they're saying there have been great controversies touching this. It's a confusion. 
People have mixed the power of the church with the power of the state. That's what they're saying. And out of this confusion, there has sprung very great wars and tumults, while the pontiffs, trusting in their power of the keys, have not only instituted new kinds of service and burdened men's consciences by reserving of cases and by violent excommunications, but have also endeavored to transfer worldly kingdoms from one to another and to despoil emperors of their power and authority. And if you want to hear an amazing story that it exemplifies this very, very strongly. Just look at the history of Henry IV, the German emperor Henry IV, and what the Pope did to him. Having him wait for almost three days outside in a very cold winter, basically naked, you know, with only very little garment. He was waiting there asking the Pope to forgive him. And the Pope was waiting there. The Pope was inside the castle, very warm, and just, it's inhuman. People had to go and appeal to the Pope for him to go and, 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 and grant the supposed forgiveness to, to the Emperor, right? So, that is quite an amazing story for me. But, you know, the son of Henry was a little smarter and he basically came to Rome, imprisoned the Pope, imprisoned the Cardinals, took the city and uh, he only let them go when they gave him everything he wanted. He wasn't right either. You know, it, it's, it's not justifying because they did something to his father. So he wasn't right, but he was smarter. And he, he actually used what he had in hand, which was the power of the state. The popes using the power of the state did much worse than this. They wouldn't just take people captive. The emperor was actually very nice. And he put them back in, you know, he just wanted them to, to do something that they were unwilling to do, which was to relinquish temporal power. He was saying, give up the, the temporal power. Let me, let me continue doing what my ancestors did, which was the uh, right of investitures. And uh, it's an amazing story, you know. So the church didn't come out, you know, clean out of that. It was always confusion. And we'll see another one yeah, near here in, in a little bit. So... Okay, we, we already mentioned this. And now the Protestants are in, still in the Augsburg Confession. They're talking about what the bishops think. They say, now their judgment is this, that the power of the keys or the power of the bishops, according to the gospel, is a power or a command from God of preaching the gospel, of remitting or retaining sins, and of administering the sacraments. This power is exercised only by teaching or preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments either to many or to single individuals in accordance with their call. For thereby, not corporeal, that means not in the body, but eternal things are granted. And then down there they say, for the civil administration is occupied about other matters. Right? So the church should be occupied about the spiritual matter and the civil administration about other matters. Then is the gospel. The magistracy does not defend the souls, but the bodies and bodily things against manifest injuries and coerces men by the sword and corporeal punishments that it may uphold civil justice and peace. Wherefore, the ecclesiastical and the civil powers are not to be confounded. They understood it pretty clearly. Huh? Do you see this? Therefore, the ecclesiastical and the civil powers power are not to be confounded. The ecclesiastical power has its own command to preach the gospel and to administer the sacraments. 
let it not by force enter into the office of another. Let it not transfer worldly kingdoms. Let it not abrogate the magistrate's laws. Let it not withdraw from them lawful obedience. And all this the popes did. They would withdraw from kings and from emperors the lawful obedience the subjects had to them. They would say, from now on, the English people don't need to obey King John. And King John then was now in trouble. Until he, he went back to the Pope and said, please forgive me. So they would take the power of the sovereigns and tell the people, don't obey your lords and actually incite war. One Pope told the King of France to make war against the King of England because the King of England didn't want to do one small thing the Pope wanted. It's amazing. If you read the, the history of Innocent the Third, you'll see this man was more like an emperor than a Pope. He would really use the state in anything he wanted. Okay, so let's continue here. Let it not... So we're talking about the, the power of the... Or the ecclesiastical power. They say, let it not withdraw from them, from the emperors and kings, lawful obedience. Let it not hinder judgments touching any civil ordinances or contracts. Let it not prescribe laws to the magistrate touching the form of the state. As Christ says, my, my kingdom is not of this world. They would even prescribe the laws to the magistrate and say, you have to do this and you have to impose this on the people. Okay. Down there it says, if the bishops have any power of the sword, they have it not as bishops by the command of the gospel, but by human law given unto them by kings and emperors for the civil government of their goods. This, however, is another function than the ministry of the gospel. They're saying if the bishops control temporal powers, they're not doing their work in the gospel. This is not given them by the word of God. This is given them by, by kings and, priests and, and, and rulers and emperors. When therefore the question is concerning the jurisdiction of bishops, civil government must be distinguished from ecclesiastical jurisdiction. And then they continue to say here, but when they teach or determine anything contrary to the gospel, then the churches have a command of God which forbids them, forbids obedience to them. Beware of false prophets. They're saying, if the priests, if the bishops teach according to the Bible, we follow them. But if they don't, we should call them false prophets and not obey them. This is the confession of Aug Augsburg, okay? So this is the Protestant declaration or, or um, kind of a Protestant constitution, the equivalent to the U.S. Constitution. It would be the Protestant basis of telling the world what they believed. So, the temporal power has always been a problem to the Roman Church. They would try to obtain temporal power, and then they would fight and make wars and receive wars from other kings and emperors because of that. Do you know why the Pope Pius VI was taken captive in 1798? I just knew that he was taken captive by birth year. But I didn't know why. Doing a little research yesterday, I, I actually understood for the first time why. So birth year entered Rome unopposed with the army. Right? With the army. Nobody opposed him. They just let him in. He was coming with the French army. He declared the city a republic, just like it was in ancient times. In the year 1140, Rome was also declared a republic. And they cast out the Pope. Did you know that? The Senate was reestablished. And, and it was due to somebody going there and preaching the gospel. Separation of church and state. The people did an uprise. The Pope tried to storm the city at the head of an, uh, an army, 
And he was wounded and he died. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? To storm the city, to take the city by storm. 1140. Okay. So, he, uh, now birth year in the year 1798, came, entered Rome, declared the city a republic, and came to the Pope and demanded the Pope to renounce his temporal power. See, he didn't say anything about religious, about ecclesiastical power. He just said, give up your temporal power. Upon refusal, the Pope was taken captive. So now you understand why. The Pope was taken captive because he didn't want to let go the temporality. That means the civil power he had. He didn't want to stay only with the religious power, right? So next year, 1799, in August, Pope Pius VI died in prison. So the temporal power has always been a problem to the popes. We will quickly read this and then we'll, we'll end the class. This is Pope uh, Nicholas I. Look what he said. This is amazing. Okay, He was talking to the emperor um, and he says this, No prince that the vicars of Christ are above the judgment of mortals and that the most powerful sovereigns have no right to punish the crimes of the popes, how enormous soever they may be. Can you believe that? And then he said, the next paragraph says, Cease then to oppose our rights and obey our orders, or else we will in our turn raise our power against yours, and will say to the nations, People, cease to bow your heads before your proud masters. Overthrow these impious sovereigns, these sacrilegious kings who have arrogated to themselves the right of commanding men and of taking away the liberty of their brethren. That strikes me as odd that the Pope is saying this because that's exactly what he is doing, what he was doing back then, right? Look what he continues to say to the prince. He says, Fear then our wrath and the thunders of our vengeance. For Jesus Christ has appointed us with his own mouth absolute judges of all men. The problem is he failed to give the verse where Jesus Christ has appointed that. <laughs> and then he says, And kings themselves are submitted to our authority. The power of the church has been consecrated before your reign and it will subsist after it. I would add here, until Jesus comes and takes the room, you know, all the, the system of Babylon down. So, just comparing the principles, the Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dear or more fundamental. Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter of August 15, 1854, said, The absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential Error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. The same Pope, in his encyclical letter of December 8, 1864, anathemized those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship. And also, all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. Do you see what the Roman church is all about? So I will skip whatever I have here and I'll come to this. This thing here, September 24, 2015. For the first time, the Pope spoke to the legislative body of the United States. He went to Congress itself. Congress is responsible for making law. So if the principles of the United States and the principles of Rome are so different, if one says that liberty of conscience is a pest, this is the Roman Church saying, and the United States says that nothing is dear than liberty of conscience. Do you know who will yield when they unite? It's not the Romish church because she never changes. Mm -hmm. It's the United States that will yield. And liberty of conscience will once again be trampled upon, but now in what was free America. We need to be ready for this and prepared. Please be prepared. There's a website, freedomsentinel.org. Check out this website. 
And let me just read to you a last quote here from Ellen White. In last day events, page 127, she says, There are many who are at ease, who are, as it were, asleep. They say, if prophecy has foretold the enforcement of Sunday observance, the law will surely be enacted. And having come to this conclusion, they sit down in a calm expectation of the event, comforting themselves with the thought that God will protect His people in the day of trouble. But God will not save us if we make no effort to do the work he has committed to our charge. Actually, the other quote, she says, we are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude, doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. Fervent, effectual prayer should be ascending to heaven that this calamity may be deferred until we can accomplish, accomplish the work which has so long been neglected. Let there be most earnest prayer, and then let us work in harmony with our prayers. We should be enlightening the people, telling them what it is, what we need to do in order to protect liberty of conscience. Uh, the last one, now is the last one. She says, it is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threat and danger. A vast responsibility is devolving upon men and women of prayer throughout the land to petition God, to petition that God may sweep back this cloud of evil and give a few more years of grace to work for the Master. Okay, so just, let's just pray that God will, will help us to see what we need to do in this time. And let's pray that we will be protected from all the threatened danger that is coming upon us. Liberty of conscience will again be restricted. But we need to enlighten the people. We need to let them know what it means to lose liberty of conscience and what it means to unite with the Roman Church. Okay, let's finish with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us and for teaching us our history. We pray, Lord, that you will protect your people and that you will use us to enlighten the world regarding liberty of conscience and what it means to lose it. Help us to see, Lord. Open our eyes and help us to be instruments for saving others. We pray and we thank you for saving us and for giving us freedom of conscience. In Jesus' name, amen.